major ruling. The Supreme Court issues a decision on a case involving the use of public funds for religious schools. We have a report and analysis. Uphill struggle. New developments in the fight against the coronavirus in the United States. Eye on Hong Kong. China passes a national security law aimed at the former British colony. And museum or mosque. Lawmakers in Turkey are set for a historic vote regarding a one-time Greek Orthodox cathedral. On EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, June 30th, 2020. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. A decision from the Supreme Court today makes it easier for religious schools to access public funds. The court examined a case involving state tax credits in Montana. The high court ruled the program can stay in place so parents can exercise religious freedom when deciding where to send their children to school. Correspondent Mark Irons reports now outside of the Supreme Court. Mark? Tracy, a big win for religious freedom today. Chief Justice John Roberts sided with the court's four conservative justices in a decision that effectively strikes down a Montana amendment that barred public funds from going to private schools. Now, some of the justices say that this amendment was created with clear anti-Catholic bigotry. Writing the court's majority opinion today, Chief Justice John Roberts said a state need not subsidize private education, but once a state decides to do so, it cannot disqualify some private schools solely because they are religious. In 2015, the Montana State Legislature created a tax credit program allowing contributions to be made to certain scholarships for private education. The scholarships could be used at both secular and religious schools, but almost all the recipients attend religious schools. After previous legal challenges, today the high court upheld the program. So it's a huge win for religious schools of all kinds. Helen Alvare, a law professor at George Mason University, says it looks as though this ruling will help strike down the Blaine Amendment. Present in more than 30 states' constitutions, it has kept public funds from private schools. And no state law and no state constitution can trump the federal constitution. Today, in conservative Justice Samuel Alito's opinion, he said the Blaine Amendment showed evidence of anti-Catholic bigotry. At previous oral arguments, Catholic Justice Brett Kavanaugh said grotesque religious bigotry against Catholics was underlying the amendment. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is applauding today's ruling. So it is a tremendous win for us to see the Supreme Court after so many years come out and say that these Blaine Amendments, which were born at a time of tremendous anti-Catholic bigotry, um, are in fact unconstitutional. The Montana Federation of Public Employees says this ruling violates Montana's commitment to public education, our, ch our children and constitution. Now, Tracy, we could see some other big rulings from the high court this week. Another case focused on Catholic schools and religious schools' ability to hire and fire employees. And that case that we've been following for years now involving the Little Sisters of the Poor. Tracy. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. Correspondent Mark Irons reporting for us tonight. And the White House is also celebrating today's Supreme Court decision. A statement from White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany reads in part, quote, laws that condition public benefits like need-based academic scholarships on religious status demonstrate state-sanctioned hostility to religion, pressure people and institutions to censor their religious views, and stigmatize disfavored religions. Joining me now on Skype is Monse Alvarado, Vice President and executive director at Beckett, a nonprofit law firm dedicated to protecting religious freedom. Monse, welcome back. Always so good to see you. Thank you so much, Tracy. It's great to be here with you. Well, Monse, I understand that Beckett filed a friend of the court brief in support of the parents in this case. What does today's decision mean in terms of non discrimination protections to religious schools? Tracy, this has been part of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberties work for over 25 years. Since our founding, we knew that this was what we wanted to focus on. And Blaine Amendments today on this historic day for religious freedom are done. The court said that they were born of bigotry and that that history means that they violate the free exercise clause. They violate religious freedom. They said that Blaine Amendments can no longer be used to deny equal treatment to religious institutions just because they're religious. And that applies exactly to schools. 
I know uh, teachers organizations have, have said that this ruling hurts public education. What do you say to that? You know, the 10% of students that already go to private schools should have equal opportunities, just like public schools, to these public programs. Trinity Lutheran was a great case about a tire scraps program, recycling tire scraps for playgrounds, where the Supreme Court said that you were not allowed to discriminate against religious schools because they wanted to participate in this program because they were religious. You're not allowed to treat them differently because they're religious. So this is a fantastic decision for religious freedom. Um, the limits that these anti-Catholic laws placed on the free exercise of religion um, are gone. They're gone and we should, we should celebrate that. Yeah, and as you know, the Blaine Amendments were a big focus in this case and today's opinion as well. Uh, for people who may not be familiar, can you fill us in on its history and impact on Catholics in this country? Absolutely. Um, at least 37 states have some form of Blaine Amendment in their state constitution. Uh, with the founding, a lot of these states uh, were forced to have these anti-Catholic uh, sections within their constitutions as part of their welcome into, into our union. Um, and we know that they came from the original anti-Catholic bigotry where uh, the, the main government at the time didn't want Catholics to have schools. And this limitation has that pernicious history that today has been ruled unconstitutional. Yeah, and this decision recognizes the unconstitutionality of Montana's Blaine Amendment. What does that mean for other states? You know, there are all sorts of ways that religious groups partner with the government, um, groups that do good. That includes groups like um, homeless shelters and prison ministries that fight recidivism and soup kitchens and hospitals. They all in every state around the country now have equal access to these government programs and to partnerships with the government on equal footing with non-religious institutions. Uh, so. If the word sectarian appears in your state constitution, the government can no longer use that as an excuse for excluding religious groups um, in their partnerships and their contracts. Monse, any final thoughts on today's ruling? It's a fantastic ruling. Uh, I'm so pleased for what it means for our country, and especially in these times um, when we're watching protests around the country, these painful times on racism, it's nice to see the Supreme Court take a stand on religious discrimination as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Monse, thank you so much for coming on. We always appreciate it. Monse Alvarado, Vice President and Executive Director at Beckett, thank you again for your insights. Thank you, Tracy. 6 months have passed since the World Health Organization warned of a mysterious cluster of pneumonia cases coming out of China. Some countries were able to address this virus and are on the mend. Others, including the United States, are still struggling. The COVID-19 pandemic not easing its grip on the United States. When you have this much disease in the country, this much infection that's spreading, sadly, and I, I take no joy in saying this stuff, I think everyone is vulnerable once again. 36 states are seeing week-to-week -week new cases rise. The South and West are getting hit especially hard. Potentially in Houston, we could go from 1,000 cases a day to 4,000 cases a day if the model's right, and eventually no health system uh, could be able to uh, accommodate this. At least 16 states have halted or pushed back reopening plans as a result of a surge in infections. Our expectation is that next week our numbers will be worse. Unlike the European Union or South Korea, the U.S. has yet to flatten the curve. Some medical experts say Americans have not been vigilant enough. It was like as if a patient was getting chemotherapy for a cancer, abolished the therapy halfway through and is upset that the cancer hasn't disappeared. One thing has dropped. The University of Washington's updated COVID-19 death projection for October 1st is just over 175,000. That's about 4,000 less than last week's forecast. While the U.S. government is supporting three clinical trials of coronavirus vaccines taking place over the next few months. The nation's medical experts were on Capitol Hill again today, testifying to a Senate committee on how to safely get Americans back to work and back to school. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric? 
Well, Tracy, the CDC director had a plea for the younger generation out there that they continue to wear their masks and take extra precautions to stop the spread of this COVID-19 pandemic. But it was the testimony of Dr. Anthony Fauci that got everyone's eyes wide because he said that there is still no guarantee that we will have a safe, effective vaccine to end this pandemic. We will at least know the extent of efficacy sometime in the winter and early part of next year. The U.S. is set to begin a 30,000 person trial of a government created shot starting next month. Under the Trump administration's program dubbed Operation Warp Speed, health officials plan to have 300 million doses on hand by January. While vaccine research is ongoing, rapid testing and therapeutic development can aid in the safe return to school, college, in the workplace. The American Academy of Pediatrics issued guidance supporting this safe return to schools. The group, quote, strongly advocates that all policy considerations for the coming school year should start with a goal of having students physically present in school. The importance of in-person learning is well documented. The CDC director says that they will soon release more guidance for schools on testing. Testing guidance for higher education in K through 12 uh, the K, uh, higher education should be posted today and K through 12 uh, later this week. These recommendations are consistent with previously published testing guidelines and are meant to supplement, not replace the guidance of local jurisdictions. All of this comes as the pandemic continues to pose a threat to the health of Americans. The disease impacts us all and it's going to take all of us working together to stop it. Together, I believe we can achieve the possible. I spoke with Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota, who told me that we will likely see more COVID-19 aid, another package after the July 4th recess. On a side note, there are currently 15 experimental vaccines that are in various stages of development worldwide. Tracy. Correspondent Eric Rosales reporting from Capitol Hill for us tonight. Thank you so much, Eric. Well, Democrats responded to reports that President Donald Trump was briefed in 2019 on intelligence that Russia offered bounties to the Taliban for the deaths of Americans in Afghanistan. His responsibility as commander in chief is to protect our troops. Uh, and I, I shared the concern at the White House today that I think many of us have, which is um, there may be a reluctance to brief the president on things he doesn't want to hear. House Democratic leaders were briefed at the White House this morning on the reports of Russian bounties, and now they want a briefing by intelligence officials for all congressional Democrats. Republicans also want to hear directly from the intelligence community. Nobody will stand for any report of somebody going after our servicemen and women with any bounty. Let's have the intel community walk through this all. Republicans want the intelligence community to verify the accuracy of the reports that Russian officials offered bounties for Afghanistan militants to kill American troops. They say if the reports are true, U.S. adversaries should expect a very swift and deadly response. Coming up, the Secretary of State weighs in on a report of China's alleged mistreatment of a religious minority. And lawmakers in Turkey are set to decide the fate of the historic Hagia Sophia. The U.S. Secretary of State is calling China's treatment of Muslim minorities shocking and disturbing. Secretary Mike Pompeo says a report on forced sterilizations, abortion, and coercive family planning for the Uyghurs in the province of Xinjiang, quote, demonstrates an utter disregard for human life. China is denouncing the criticism, and a foreign ministry spokesman claims the accusations are baseless. China also passed the controversial national security law for Hong Kong today. The leader of Hong Kong is defending the law. The legislation aims to prevent, curb, and punish acts of cessation, subversion of state power, terrorist activities, and collusion with foreign or external forces to endanger national security. That was Carrie Lam speaking in a video message to the UN Human Rights Council, saying the new national security law only targets a small minority. More protesters were arrested at a rally in a shopping mall in Hong Kong today. Police have arrested dozens this week.
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu plans to exert control over parts of the West Bank this week. But his main coalition partner wants to wait until after the coronavirus pandemic. Yachad. Defense Minister Benny Gantz, who just weeks ago agreed to form a government with Netanyahu, now says annexing parts of the Judea and Samara should be delayed. The prime minister says this week he wants to begin annexing land where Jews have settlements in line with President Donald Trump's Mideast peace plan. That the 13-year arms embargo on Iran must be continued. It cannot expire. Brian Hook, the U.S. Special Representative for Iran, visiting Israel. He is pushing for a continuation of the arms embargo on Iran, which is supposed to expire in October. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo spoke to the U.N. Security Council earlier today on the Iran nuclear deal. Vatican prosecutors have ordered the seizure of documents and computers from the administrative offices of St. Peter's Basilica. The move appears to signal a new investigation into the Holy See's finances. Pope Francis also named a special commissioner today to run the basilica and to reorganize some of its offices. Lawmakers in Turkey will decide later this week whether an ancient building at one time Greek Orthodox Cathedral will be converted into a mosque. Hagia Sophia was built in the year 537. It was an Eastern Orthodox cathedral before being converted into a mosque following the fall of Constantinople in the 14th century. Since 1935, it has been a public museum. Joining us now from Rome is Andrea Galliaducci, Vatican analyst for EWTN News, and he has been following this story for us. Andrea, welcome back. Well, thank you. It's nice to be with you. So, Andrea, give us some background on Hagia Sophia. Well, Hagia Sophia, as you know, has been the cathedral of the Orthodox Church in Constantinople, that is now Istanbul, and has been the cathedral until the 14th century, when Constantinople fell and was taken by the Ottoman Empire, that was Muslim, and so the Muslims turned it into a mosque. It was in to some extent, a sort of black for Hagia Sophia, because Hagia Sophia was uh, at least renovated, and it's, it's, it worked as a, a mosque until uh, the 1933, 1935, when there was an overturn of the Ottoman Empire. Kemal Ataturk founded uh, uh, the new Turkish state, the modern Turkish state, and wanted uh, Hagia Sophia to be a museum, not a church, not any religious kind of gathering in Hagia Sophia, to avoid any kind of religious con contention in that. And he stayed as such until now. Now it's been some years that Erdogan, the president of Turkey, wants to turn it into a mosque again. And on July the 2nd, the Council of State of Turkey will finally rule whether Hagia Sophia will be a mosque again or not. So what are Christians and faith leaders saying about this debate? Well, as I, as I said, uh, Hagia Sophia was an Orthodox cathedral, so most of the voices were from the Orthodox churches. There was the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople that uh, uh, actually uh, protested strongly against uh, the Erdogan wish, and uh, so the, the same did the Moscow Patriarchate. Then there was a sort of uh, intermediate position by the Armenian Church, Armenian Apostolic Church, that said, well, let's turn Hagia Sophia into a worship place, but not just for Muslims a worship place for everyone, Muslims, Christians, because this could be a sign for the world. It's very significant that the Turkish, uh, the Catholic uh, Turkish Bishops' Conference, uh, they took an intermediate position as well. They said, we cannot say anything about the decisions of the government because we're not, we don't have a juridical status. It seems a weak position. In fact, uh, the, the Catholic bishops are just saying that in Turkey, the situation for Catholic is difficult because they don't have juridical status. It's a sort of statement to explain their situation over there. Andrea, I know the vote is expected on Thursday. Are there any indications which way it'll go? Well, according to the polls, uh, most the majority of Turkish people wants, uh, want Hagia Sophia to be uh, again a mosque. Uh, I think that the Council of State will rule uh, that Hagia Sophia will turn into a, a mosque again. But I don't know if uh, then Erdogan will uh, follow through this decision. It's mostly political debate, mostly uh, the re a sort of renaissance of the Muslim pride over there. Uh, but I don't know how much Erdogan will go through, because if he wants to stay in the Western world, he will have to face a lot of problems 
protests uh, from many uh, churches, especially Orthodox churches that, by tradition, are linked to states. Well, Andrea, thank you so much. We always appreciate your insight. Andrea Galliaducci, Vatican Analyst for EWTN News. Thank you again. Thank you. Up next, in the wake of yesterday's Supreme Court ruling, how pro-lifers in Louisiana will continue their fight for the unborn. Now, following yesterday's Supreme Court ruling overturning a Louisiana law holding abortion clinics to the same standards as other surgical centers, pro-lifers in the state are vowing to continue the fight to defend the unborn and to protect the health and safety of women. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about the ruling and its impact is Angie Thomas, Associate Director of Louisiana Right to Life. Angie, welcome to the show and thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be on EWTN. Well, Angie, lawmakers, legal scholars, and pro-life leaders have all criticized yesterday's ruling. What was your reaction when you heard the news? Well, we were extremely disappointed that the court has chosen to continue with its abortion distortion, that laws apply to everyone else except for abortion facilities. And we were also disappointed that they really didn't address the standing issue. So, and overall, just that they really came in and usurped the will of the entire state, the entire legislative process just got wiped away with just five judges' decisions. Yeah, and I know that you've described this as a loss for the health and safety of women. What are your concerns now that there isn't legislation giving them protections? And what, if anything, do you think can be done now? Yes, the impact of this case is just huge on women's health because the clinics here in Louisiana are substandard. The violations that those clinics have year after year. I mean, in Louisiana, we even had a radiologist and an ophthalmologist doing abortions. So it was incredibly sad to, to think that these poor women who are going into abortions are also getting substandard care. And they, they, when they sign up to get an abortion, they're not signing up for poor medical care. Yeah, so Louisiana we Right to Life also. Helpful. Absolutely. Uh, sorry for the interruption, but I know Louisiana Right to Life helped to file the Unsafe Abortion Protection Act, and it received widespread support from both parties in the state when it passed. What message do you think this decision sends to the people of your state? Well, the people of our state, we are so pro-life here in Louisiana, so we, we will not lose hope, hope. We will continue to work towards common sense legislation and continue to work for the women and children of our state. Uh, we are very excited about a new, uh, a new thing that's going to be happening this fall. We have the constitutional amendment for the state of Louisiana on the ballot this fall in the presidential uh, ballot. So we're very excited about that. The people of Louisiana will have the opportunity to vote for a constitutional amendment that states that there is no right to abortion or the funding of abortion in our state constitution. So we truly believe that if we can get the word out, the people of our state will come out and vote to have that constitutional amendment. So we, we, are, we remain hopeful. Anything else that you have going on uh, in your organization to help defend the right to life? Yes, you know, we are always going to work to provide real support for women in unplanned pregnancies, to support the work of wonderful pregnancy centers around our state, to provide women with real resources. And, you know, for those women who do choose to, to get an abortion, we will never stop reaching out and trying to educate them. But if they do get the abortion, we certainly will continue to pray for each and every one of them. Well, Angie, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. And we also thank you for what you do. Angie Thomas, Associate thank Director of Louisiana Right to Life. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.